Welcome and thank you to all attending today for joining us. I'm going to kick off with a brief introduction. I'm Susan Patrick, the President and CEO of iNACL. I'm so glad that everyone could join us today. Today's webinar is on increasing English language learner success in online and blended learning. And we're focused on social emotional learning. This webinar today is brought really by popular demand. Uh, Maui Askanum was a presenter at the iNACL Symposium last fall, and we had so many requests for his presentation and requests to follow up with a webinar today. Uh, honestly, we are thrilled to have Maui present with us and um, to be able to have him here. Um, today's webinar uh, will be available on the iNACL website. We will be archiving and recording the webinar. Um, we encourage you to engage in the discussion and type questions in the chat room. The chat is in the lower left-hand side of the screen if you're not familiar with it. And you can type for the whole room or uh, chat with individuals. But I will be facilitating your questions, and we'll have time at the end for Maui to address your questions, too. Uh, I'd like to introduce our speaker today. Maui Askinum has written eight books that are read in thousands of classrooms across North America and spoken to over one million students and educators in more than 40 states. Maui's learning online leadership courses have inspired students around the world. As a child, Maui fled civil war in Ethiopia and survived a Sudanese refugee camp for three years. After being resettled in the United States, Maui overcame poverty, language barriers, and personal tragedy to graduate from Harvard University, where he gave the commencement address to an audience of 30,000. Maui's best-selling memoir of Beatles and Angels, A Boy's Remarkable Journey from a Refugee Camp to Harvard, has been read as a one book, one community reading selection by thousands of schools and communities, including the cities of Philadelphia and Green Bay, Wisconsin. His latest book, The Five Powers of an Educator, helps parents and educators to recognize and leverage their power to profoundly impact the lives of youth. Citing the impact of Maui's work, the Illinois Association of Teachers of English named Maui the 2006 Illinois Author of the Year. Media outlets that have featured Maui include the Oprah Winfrey Show, quote, one of the 20 best moments of Oprah's career, Essence, one of the 40 most inspiring African Americans, and the Chicago Tribune, Boston Globe, Seattle Times, Harvard Magazine, and Ebony Magazine. I am so pleased today to have uh, Maui join us and let me go ahead and turn it over to you, Maui. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Thank you so much, Susan. And if you can hear me right now, let's give uh, show me that by giving a thumbs up or smiley face to uh, Inekal and Susan for uh, this wonderful opportunity for us to learn together. So thank you, Susan, for your organization's hard work. I see uh, I see those check marks. That's fantastic. So um, and I will. I have attended the last couple Inekal conferences. So. Uh, and I've enjoyed them very much, Susan, and I'm, I hope all of you attend them as well. I hope to meet a lot of you in person this fall when I will be there uh, as well. So uh, so thank you. And, you know, I love when I first started working with students, I got to tell you guys, I thought it was all about the students. Um, and so I, I wrote all my books and I did all my um, speeches and I really wanted to work with the students. But what I learned over time was that the best way to help students within a, within, within a building is to help the educators is to help those of you that are on uh, on this on this call on this illuminate with us right and and on this collaborate with us and it's the educators through your passion through your love through your commitment to students that really inspire the students and that's why I'm so excited to be here with you today uh, and as you can see this is going to be the agenda that we have we're going to start by looking at why social emotional learning um, uh, matters for English language learners uh, then we're going to get into what I call lead with super um, uh, then coach for growth. 
And then finally, we're going to have a Q&A. And this is really designed, I've, I've really um, designed this so that you can be an educator at any level, uh, kindergarten all the way to 12th grade, and benefit from our time together. Now, my work happens to be a lot more with older students, grades 6 and up, but we do a lot of professional development at all ages, and we work with um, uh, English language learners across the spectrum. So, um, so let's get started by looking at why social emotional learning matters for English learners, right? And uh, here's some things that kids have said to me. I want you to look at this. It says, it says, kids make fun of me because I smell like onions and garlic. Another kid, I still remember the kid who said this to me at uh, Mather High School in Chicago. She said, um, you know, they call me Saddam or Osama because I speak Arabic. And she told me she got bullied relentlessly because of her background. Just imagine what that would be like to be in a country and to be associated and talked about um, uh, uh, with, with, with the Samas and the Saddams and to have kids call you that day after day. Um, so another student says, my parents won't let me join a sport because I'm a girl. We see this in a lot of schools I visit that the, uh, the boys are able to do a lot more activities and do a lot more, but the girls aren't able to do it, right? And then the only friends I have are other English language learner students, right? Um, if you go on to the next page, you see more. I don't want to speak my native language. I just want to fit in and be like the students in the United States. It's not important for me to speak Spanish or Arabic or Vietnamese or whatever it might be. Um, here's another one. I am ashamed to be from fill in the blank. So I remember I was ashamed to be from Ethiopia for a long time. Um, I hope my parents never come to school. You know, it's really interesting as I came to many education conferences. I heard many educators talk about how important it was to engage parents the last thing I wanted lots of times was for my parents to be engaged because uh, I didn't want them to show up at my school, speak in their broken accent, embarrass me, humiliate me, and a lot of English learners feel the same way. Um, my mom wants me to work 40 hours a week to send money back home for my sick grandma. It's a tough thing. We want them to do their homework, read after school, uh, and they got to work 40 hours a week sometimes. And everyone but me goes on play dates. That's for the younger kids. Um, I got a seven-year-old and six-year-old, so um, uh, so that's the play dates. And then uh, the school dances. Like for example, I can tell you, at my high school in in Illinois, I didn't go to one school dance because my parents had gotten married had gotten married uh, through an arranged marriage, and they considered dating a unique American wickedness that was um, something that would not be allowed in our home, right? And so. So when we think about our students, if our EL students, if all we care about is where they are on their WIDA score, you know, on their, on their test scores, whether they're um, graduating from our EL program uh, and looking at their test scores um, and not looking at the, through the struggles they go through in terms of culture, in terms of their emotions, in terms of uh, uh, what it's like just to step in a building uh, um, each and every single day, um, how can we really be fully educating them, right? And, you know, SEL, social emotional learning, is one of those things that has so many definitions. Uh, there are so many research reports about it where you can see different angles on it. We don't even have a common language for it. Some people call it non-cognitive skill building. Some folks call it character education. Some folks um, call it metacognition. There's all sorts of, of, of terms that we use. Uh, so I'll just offer for you at the top of this slide, I offer for you a very simple way that I like to think about social emotional learning. It's also how I define leadership training in my courses. I just say simply, it's power that comes from how we think and act. It's power that all of us have. It's power that Susan, who introduced me, has. It's power that all of you here have. It's power that all our kids have. And it doesn't depend on their race. It doesn't depend on, how, on their wealth. Any student can access this power. So we can help a student go from a, a thought that's limiting, like I don't want to speak my native language, to a thought that's empowering such as I do want to speak my native language, and that doesn't cost them money to, to think like that, right? Um, it's just a shift in thinking, right, that we can have and go on. So social-emotional learning um, is a powerful tool and lever for student success, as you will see. And in, this, uh, in, this, in our time together, I'm going to focus specifically on how it works for English language learners, right? Um, that's why we're all here together. So, um, so this is my story. As you heard uh, earlier in the introduction, I'm a refugee from Ethiopia. That's we, me with my family, uh, my mother there. Um, I, that's my book of Beatles and Angels. That's the updated cover that Lord Brown is releasing later this year. That's me on the Oprah show. And I want to stress to you two things um, as you look at these pictures. The first is that I still remember when my family first came to the United States. And my father actually shared this with us when we were in a refugee camp living in a hut. He said to us, we're going to go to this place called America, 
and we don't know what it's going to be like. And the reason we're going there, we heard that our kids can get an education and have a better life. That's why we're going to go and see if it's true, if we can access this. And so my family came, and we were resettled um, outside, of Chicago, outside of Chicago in a, town called, in a town called Wheaton. That's where we grew up. And um, I, I, I say that to you just because um, that really, that's what has made everything possible for me, is the opportunity I had as a kid that grew up in low-income housing, as a kid that whose my father was legally blind, so he couldn't work. And yet, I was able to go to public schools. Um, I was able to go to your schools and have a better life. And today, I'm a business owner. Um, I have employees. I'm an author. I get to pursue my dreams in so many ways because I had wonderful educators who gave me opportunity. And that's why all of you are here with me today, is that you want to do the same for your students. You want to help them have opportunity in this country and be contributing uh, members of our society regardless of what their starting point is when they come here. Now, the second thing I'll share with you is that SEL was a key part of my journey. When I was in ninth grade, entering ninth grade, um, I had just finished eighth grade. I was a CD student in eighth grade. I got a D in my, in my math class, for example. Um, I'd gotten kicked off my basketball team, so I'd gotten in trouble. I had a lot of problems and challenges. Four years later, I'd gotten into every college I applied to, including Harvard and Yale. Um, and, uh, and the transformation that allowed me to do that, it wasn't because my family got more money. We were still poor. It wasn't because um, all of a sudden my father got his eyesight back. In fact, things got worse on the outside. Uh, on the outside. Like I lost my best friend, my older brother, in a car accident. But I was able to go, when I was in high school, on an SEL journey where I was able to shift my thinking about a lot of things. I grew in confidence. I was able to, I learned how to set goals. And, and that experience I had in high school is why after I graduated from Harvard, I dedicated myself the last 15 years to helping other students go on powerful journeys where they find out they have a lot more ability and they can grow in so many ways, just like I did, right? And so let's now talk about online and blended, right? Because this, this, our time together isn't just to talk about uh, English learners and social emotional learning, we're going to look at how do you also harness online and blended learning to do it, right? Uh, and so I first got to know um, online, uh, the world of online education about six years ago. I had the opportunity um, to give a keynote um, uh, at, a, at the conference for Florida Virtual School. And they're a wonderful organization. If you don't know about them, I encourage you to uh, check them out, flvs.net. Um, and I gave that keynote, and we developed, I developed a relationship with them, and we created uh, a course called Leadership Skills Development. Uh, and that Leadership Skills Development class, um, really, I viewed it as my opportunity to really empower any young person if, uh, with um, the SEL skills to have a better life, right? And, uh, and that course did very well. Um, it ended up winning the Cody Award. We were able to help lots of students. And from there, that showed me, wow, you really can uh, inspire students and, and, and really help them go on these amazing journeys using online and blended learning, right? And so how did we get to the world of English learners? Well, here's what happened. I, I don't know if a lot of if you've seen data like this. This is absolutely devastating data. We see it often now in publications like Education Week. Like this is straight out of Ed Week. It says nearly 75% of California's English language learners in grades 6 to 12 have been in the state schools for seven or more years and still fall short of enough fluency in English to succeed academically. What is this report telling us? It's telling us that there's hundreds of thousands of students, in this case in California, who wanted to have the same dream that I was, that I, that I was able to access, who were languishing in schools year after year and not growing. It's telling us that many of our English learners in our classrooms, many of your students perhaps, are stuck. They're not growing at the appropriate rate. And it's really going to hurt their families. It's going to hurt them when they don't have the skills to uh, participate and contribute in our global economy, right? And so I found this to be devastating when I saw this data I, I, because um, I, I, it, it showed me that, wow, just being in this country, just having the opportunity to be here isn't enough for our English learners. We really have to help them grow in some amazing, in some new ways. And so we had the opportunity and it, and it first started actually with, with our work with Florida Virtual School. There was a partner. We had a major district that said, hey, um, can you do something for our English learners? Um, this particular district had over 200,000 English learners in their system. And they said, 
we need a course for them. Can you create an online course for them? And that's what we did. We created a course called uh, uh, Super ELL that you see here. Um, we take the students on a journey where they believe, they see, they achieve, they grow, and they fly. Um, uh, and, and they really grow. And we've seen tremendous results with the course. So, for example, on this page you see this is a report that's going to come out later this year um, uh, that uh, is being conducted by uh, an independent um, uh, evaluator um, that showed that for the student, for high school students that uh, received this kind of SEL training, EL students, A's went up by 44%, F's went down by 41%. Now, I hope some of you out there are really are thinking, Maui, those are phenomenal results. How did you get those results? Well, I'm going to share that with you for the rest of the webinar. That you're going to see the approach we took and the mindset we have about developing English language learners. That you can get results like this, right? And and that's that's what we're going to do. And I'm proud of this because to me, each and every single student we help is a student that we now have put on a path towards the American dream, right? I am now able. Just me getting educated has changed everything for my family. I'm able to do things for my mom, help her in so many ways. I was able to take her to go see her mother in Ethiopia, something she wasn't able to do for 15 years. I was able to do that for her. Um, and so let's jump in now into how, what's the right approach to, to working with English language learners? Right? How, do you, how do you get those kind of results? So the first thing is what I call lead with super. Okay, lead with super. And here's what I mean by that. Remember those quotes we had earlier? What if instead the quotes were like this? I am proud of my family and culture. What if, instead, what if we turned those deficits into lifelong assets? If we said things like, I, instead of saying I'm ashamed of onions and garlic, we said I invite people to see how good onion, onions, and, uh, onions and garlics can taste. Um, and that's, basically, that's my culture, by the way. In Ethiopian culture, we took a lot of onions and garlic, right? And what if we had students saying, some people spent $100,000 and 10 years to learn something I already know, Spanish. I will preserve it. Maybe in the chat box, if some of you have taken out debt to learn Spanish or had to go to school to learn Spanish, um, indicate that. And let's all reflect on the fact that a lot of our English language learner students, they were 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 years old. They already had the knowledge that you saw in their heads, right? Um, that's that asset perspective, right? They like, like they, they already, they already, so when I came to this country, for example, I spoke Arabic um, fluently because I lived in a refugee camp in Sudan. I quickly forgot Arabic when I came here because I, I was ashamed of it, right? I didn't want people to know I spoke Arabic. And guess what happened? When I went to Harvard, one of my classmates at Harvard spent four years and over $120,000 to learn what? To learn Arabic. What I, and guess what? My classmate at Harvard who graduated in Arabic studies, I knew Arabic better than he did when I was six, and I learned it for free. So our students bring so many assets, and thank you. Yes, I see that, um, Susan. It is so important to move from deficit mindsets to understanding the assets each student, each student brings. I completely agree. So that's a super yellow philosophy. It's a philosophy that all students are strong, powerful, and full of assets they can leverage to succeed. They are not ELL, but super ELL. And when we're dealing, you've got to remember, when you're an English language learner, there are so many, so many, so many times when you feel like you're less than other people. You're behind in your academics. Culturally, you don't fit in. Like, there's so many things that make you feel like you're less than other people. So we have to aggressively create that environment where the students feel like, yes, um, I am valued. I am respected. I have assets. So what does that look like? What does that look like? Let me show you what that might look like, okay? So I want you to think about, I know, you, I know my, um, none of your schools are like this, so I'm going to ask you to think about where your friend's school is, okay? Um, and so, um, so on a scale of 1 to 10, on a, on a scale of 1 to 10, when you think about your school and the conversations people might have uh, uh, in just w w informally, um, when they talk about English learners in your district, do they say, one would be like, hey, you mean these students are staying? And a 10 would be, they make our school so much better. A 1 would be, they're too hard to teach. And a 10 is, I cannot wait to see them grow. A 1 is, they require so much of our staff in school. And a 10 is, they give us global diversity and perspective that we couldn't even, there's no way we could pay for it. In fact, one of the things that amazes me 
one of the things that amazes me, guys, is when I go to a place like Harvard Business School, up, they always say things like, we want to create global leaders, leaders that can interact with people of all backgrounds. So many, of, so many of you have that in your buildings. You have the opportunity to create schools where students of all backgrounds are interacting and learning, and they can be places where students are learning the abilities to connect with folks from a global audience, but that only happens if we have that super ELL mindset. So I want you to get, so I've, I've asked this question to lots of superintendents privately, and I've said to them, I, don't, if you, I, won't, I won't show this to anybody, you know, unless I do it in math, like I'm doing like this, um, where is your school district at? I've asked a lot of principals where they're at. I want you to type in the average that people tell me. What do you think the average is? Type in the chat box, what do you think the average number, one to 10, that most educators tell me they're at in terms of their asset base versus deficit base? For, for English learners. So I'm seeing a lot of fives, a lot of sixes, a lot of fours. And can I tell you guys something? You're being very generous because most people I talk to, um, they look me in the eye and they say we're at a three or four. And they know they're at a three or four. And they're trying to get to that seven, eight. And yet, and, and, and can I just also share something with you? I remember I worked with a school in Minnesota. And the first time I worked with them, there were 1,400 kids. And there were maybe... 10 English learners in the school. The next time I came to the school, there were about 1,900 kids, and about 1,200 Somalian students were there. In, in just like a five-year span, it changed that quickly. So what I'm sharing with you is that although people are three or four, you've got to understand people are experiencing massive demographic shifts sometimes, and it's requiring them to take some time to really think about, okay, who are our students? How do we have that asset base? So what I'm trying to say is, if you're in a three, four, five, have some empathy for yourself and just think about how do we get to the seven, eight, nine. And it's going to take time. Now, I want to give you my favorite strategy, very quick, very simple, that you can use to get an eight, nine, ten. Okay? Now, this is this. So, and, and I'll, I'll start by talking about something else first. So, I was talking to a friend who taught me something amazing. Uh, he, uh, he taught me that if I'm ever in a situation where um, someone's talking about someone and I want to make them stop, um, he gave me a great method for doing that. So, for example, let's say that someone is talking about Susan, right, our moderator, and, uh, and someone says, you know, Susan did this and that and this and that, and I don't like this about Susan and that and that. The way that I can make that stop is I can say just any positive thing. It can be like, you know what, Susan's great at gardening. Susan has a great jump shot in basketball. You know, Susan actually was so kind to that neighbor. As long as you say something positive about Susan in that situation, that's going to give the person the signal, oh, this isn't going to fly around here, right? And that's the same approach we should have to our English learners. When we see someone making a 1, 2, 3, 4 statement, I want you to instead make an 8, 9, 10 statement right there. So to say, hey, you know what? We are so lucky to have these students here. They're so phenomenal. Um, they start talking about how difficult it is or how the parents are so hard to work with. You say, you know what? I, 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 I got to tell you something. There's this parent that was so amazing. They, they did this and that. They um, taught me um, something about their culture that blew me away. They taught me a story. And what that will do is that will shift a lot of the micro conversations that exist in that district little by little towards the 7, 8, 9, 10, because all of you are constantly having those conversations, right? So that's, that's just a simple strategy that you can use um, at any time. You can also use it, of course, uh, if someone's talking about somebody, you want to make them stop. So uh, you learn two things there, right? So, um, so all right, let's keep going then, okay? So one of the things we do in our course, and something I encourage all of you to do who are working with English language learners to build that asset base is, we provide students in our course with endless examples of successful English learners. And there are some instructors of our course actually um, uh, on this, on, on, on this uh, uh, webinar with us, and um, they will tell you that we teach the students about people like Sergi, um, uh, Sergi Brin. How many of y'all love Google? I love Google. Like, I use Google for so many things. Do you guys know that Sergi came to this country um, and, to, and escaped persecution from, from Russia? And he had to learn English. He had struggles. And today, he's a co-founder of Google, something that probably all of us use each and every single day. Maisie that you see here, and I apologize if I'm mispronouncing her name, she's in our course. We tell the students, yeah, t feel free to share your own stories in the chat. Absolutely. Thank you for pointing that out. So Maisie that you see here, she's, her family came from Japan to the U.S. when she was eight. She didn't know any English. Her parents got separated. 
because her, her father got, had some addictions, um, went through so many struggles. Today she's a United States senator, right? So we want students to hear about all these stories, right? We want students to hear that, hey, there's a kid like you that really, really, really struggled. We tell them about the author of The Kite Runner. I don't know if any of you read that book, The Kite Runner. He came to this country at age 15, didn't know any English. He learned English and went on to write this beloved New York Times bestseller book that so many people have enjoyed. And so we want to consistently uh, do that. And that's actually one of, the, one of the resources, free resources I want to offer all of you is we created SuperELL.com, which is a free uh, blog and community for English language learner teachers where you can access free Super EL Hero stories you can use with your students. Um, there's other teaching resources, a blog. And my goal, one of my goals is to build the biggest library of English learner success stories um, that exist and put it up there for you that you can all go there and download things that you need for your students to inspire them, whatever age level they're at. And the reason that's so important to me is I didn't have examples when I was growing up. The only English learners I knew um, were people like my family, and all the parents had jobs like my parents, which were minimum wage jobs. Like my mom never had a job that was a minimum wage, and the reason was she didn't have the education. She, she, she came to this country. She'd never gone to school for a day in her life. So I didn't know that there were folks who were doing all these things from my background. And I thought to myself, this is a great way to build that asset mindset. So that's the first thing I really want you to walk away from with this method is it's non-negotiable. Everyone is working with English learners. All our schools, we need to challenge ourselves and ensure that we're leading with that super mentality. These kid, that kid that just showed up that smelled like onion and garlic, that kid who's so hard to understand, that kid who's never been in a school and he doesn't even know how to sit in this chair. Like, I view that kid through that strength, through their strengths. And, and I have no doubt that that kid can have a wonderful life in this country and can contribute to our country and that we can offer him or her vast opportunity. That's how we look at it. And can I tell you guys something? You don't have to solve every kid's problem. Like, there were so many problems I had that my educators couldn't solve. They couldn't, they couldn't, they didn't have, they couldn't give my money, my family money when we ran out of rent money in eighth grade and had to move across town. There weren't educators that could hit a button and bring my dad's eyesight back. There weren't educators that could go back and give my mom those lost years or help her uh, or end the war in Ethiopia so that she could go back. We had a, there weren't educators that could bring my brother back, my best friend, after he died. And you will find when you work with your English learners that they will have challenges that break your heart and, and, and that you will feel like overwhelmed by that sometimes. And, and I want you to remember from my story that even though I had all those challenges and nobody solved all those problems for me, I still went to Harvard. I still was able to reach my dreams, and I was still able to overcome a lot of stuff. So your job isn't to solve all the students' problems. You know, your job is to approach them with that asset mindset, love them, care about them, and then do the next thing we're going to talk about, which is coach for growth. So can you talk more about SEL and ELL in the context of online learning? Okay, so I will, uh, I will talk more about that, Winmar. I see your question there. Uh, we'll definitely include that. So let's go back to, stag to, to, to this point now. Um, and, it, and this is that stagnation. When you think about English learners, um, stagnation is our number one enemy, right? Um, stagnation is our number one enemy uh, because we're seeing the data is very clear that our students aren't growing. And so how do we approach that? Okay, well, let's use research to attack stagnation. There's all this research around what helps students grow. For example, um, on the left there, you see a research report from the University of Chicago where they went through all the literature, they went through all the literature um, uh, on social emotional learning. They received a grant from the Lumina Foundation. And these PhDs said, hey, here's the key methods that you can use to, uh, from a non-cognitive SEL perspective to help students learn. So a good way to think about it is, uh, and pictures always simplify things and really help us learn, is we want to help the students grow in their achievement, right? And that's usually how we think about it. How can we help the student have a higher, uh, go from one reader level to one access score level to the next access score level? How can we help the student um, uh, reading literacy rate uh, level go up? That kind of thing, right? And especially with the accountability that so many of our schools have, all the metrics that are there, that's really where our schools have focused the last 15 years, right? And what the research on social emotional learning has shown us is that, well, let's look below the red line. Um, there's learning behaviors 
that drive achievement. And underneath the learning behaviors, there's learning mindsets, such as the growth mindset that drive the learning behaviors that drive the achievement, right? So let's take an example. If you look at the bottom here, I believe my intelligence grows with effort. That's a mindset, right? A lot of you recognize that as the growth mindset. If you believe that, aren't you more likely to have the behavior of trying harder assignments? And that will lead you to achieve more. Let's go to the next one. Another, mind, another mindset or belief that's, research, that's shown by research to help students excel academically is, and you can say, I belong in this school. If you say that, you're more likely to have the behavior, which is I have higher attendance, and then you're more likely to achieve more. Again, if you're able to say, I believe I can learn English, that will lead you to have the behavior of I speak up in class, and then you'll achieve more, right? So there's a very direct and clear link between the mindsets we have, leading to the behaviors, leading to achievement. That's why we always want to look at the social emotional factors that determine student success, right? So let me share with you my story of how I became an, an, an L, LTSL. And uh, so that's the term I made up for this webinar. So an LTEL is a long-term English learner, right? I'm going to type that in the chat box in case you guys um, uh, uh, want that there. That's a long-term English learner. Those are those students that get stuck. Well, I actually got stuck as a Spanish learner. Um, what happened to me was I took Spanish from eighth grade all the way through 12th, the senior year in high school. And I even took it for one year when I was at Harvard. And my freshman year at Harvard, I took Spanish. And can I tell you guys something? After six years of taking Spanish, and I got A's every single time, I still barely knew any Spanish. If anyone's had a similar experience of going for five or six years in a foreign language class and, and not growing very much, please give me a thumbs up or a smiley face or a check mark or anything like that so I know I'm not alone with this experience. Yeah, I see a lot of that, right? A lot of folks are typing that in, right? So you know what happened? Here's, here's what happened. Um, so in Spanish, there's a word called escuchar, and, and that basically means do hear. You know what the problem was, guys? I spent six years doing the same thing. I would conjugate escuchar. I'd forget about it. I'd conjugate it the next year. I'd forget about it. I, would, I was just doing the same thing again and again and again, and that's why I wasn't growing, right? A good way to think about it is look at these two circles. The can-do circle is in the middle, and the can-do circle consists of all the things that you can do. The not-yet circle consists of all of the things you cannot do yet, right? And, and so for me, what was happening was I was stuck in my can-do circle conjugating escuchar again and again and again. And what was in my not yet circle? Reading entire books in Spanish, speaking with native Spanish speakers, multimedia projects in Spanish, writing five-page papers in Spanish. I didn't do these things. And that's why I didn't grow. That's why after six years, I hadn't grown at all. Now, the same thing, unfortunately, happens to our English learners a lot of times. A lot of times they'll come to class and they can do that, but they're not doing the things in their not yet circles that will actually lead to growth. They're not joining activities. They're not speaking up in class and asking questions. They're not making not EL friends. They're not reading at home every day. They're not trying hard assignments. They're just showing up and doing the same thing. That's why they stagnate again and again. And you as the educator, your job is to ferociously get them out of that can-do circle into the not yet so that they grow again and again and again, right? And, and so some of the ways we do that in our course is, for example, we give students uh, assignments that stretch them. So their very first assignment, um, we ask them to draw an inner map. Um, uh, and, uh, and, and so uh, a lot of them have never drawn an inner map before. They don't even know what it is. It's something that we made up at Maui Learning, right? Um, you can see this as an example of my inner map where I describe um, some of the things that make up my inner landscape, right? And so, um, so we give students assignments like this that challenge them, that stretch them. We give them other assignments like this one. So one of the things that's so, uh, uh, one of the things that's amazing to me is that um, so many of our English learners they want to go to college. Actually, we've surveyed over 
2,000 English learners in Spanish, and we ask them, do you want to go to college? 98% of them say they want to go to college. And yet, many of them are going to be in the same situation that I'm in, which is that their parents haven't gone to college, and they have to be the first person in their family to figure this out. Like, for example, my family, I was the one translating all the forms. The first time my family heard, the, my mom heard the word, my mom and dad heard the words Harvard or Yale was when I told them I got in. And so one of the things that we do for our students is we challenge them. We say, hey, there's resources online where you can go figure out the graduation rate of any college. And we teach them, why would you go to school with a low graduation rate, 4.2%, when you could go to school with a 59% graduation rate. And now you might be thinking, Maui, how can a level one English learner do this? How can a level one English learner, let's say a student just showed up from Cuba two weeks ago, which a lot of our students have, and they're put in our course. Um, you know what we find is there's a whole array of tools that you can provide that student with to help them be able to do an assignment like this. In fact, maybe some of our teachers can type in some of those things, but the students use things like Google Translator and um, they're able to access the assignment um, and figure it out and still complete it. We have video summaries of every lesson in Spanish uh, uh, for the Spanish-speaking students, which are 80% of the market, so that even that level one student can understand what the assignment is and, 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 then, and, then, try to, um, uh, and then try their best at the assignment. And what we're looking for always is we're looking for growth. Even if the student didn't complete the assignment at the same level as a student that was uh, born here and, and, and was fluent in English, we're judging the student on whether they're expanding their not yet circle. So we want to give stretch assignments to them and then provide resources. Regroup students a lot of times where students help each other complete the assignments, right? And we find um, the other thing that, for example, one thing that Florida Virtual School did, which was pretty awesome, was they were able to assign bilingual, edu bilingual teachers um, to the English learners in our courses, right? So um, having Spanish-speaking teachers um, teach, lead our courses made a huge, huge impact, right? And so the whole point is if you, don't, if you just give students things like, well, I want you to write the alphabet A, B, C again and again and again, and I want you to just kind of um, uh, do very basic things, you won't find, you won't be really stretching the students enough. They'll still be stuck in their can-do circles, right? Um, and, and if you give them these stretch assignments where they have to try new things, um, where they have to look up things like that, um, they will grow. They will grow. So it's up to us to have the expectations that they will rise to that, right? And then provide whatever resources we can to help them in that way. Now, when I think of English language learner instructors, um, I, I, view, I view you guys, I view all of you, um, as ELL growth coaches. Like, like, your job is to help the student grow. It's not just to teach the student. Like, it's to help them grow socially, emotionally, academically, into that not yet circle. And you provide personalized growth coaching for each student. So what I mean by that is, if we go to the next page, is we're able to do this um, really well in a lot of our blended implementations. Um, and so, we have the students set what we call MAD goals in the not yet circle. Um, and, and a MAD goal is a measurable, attainable, deadline-driven goal. Um, so for example, not MAD would be, I will get better at English. So that's not a MAD goal, right? Because that's just, we don't know if they, if they did that or not. But a MAD goal is, I will read for 15 minutes outside of class every day this week. So if you can, get a, if you can help a student set a goal in their not yet circle, of what they're going to read and all that kind of stuff, um, then that, that, then you can follow up with that student and say, hey, did you do that? And by the way, if some of the folks who currently teach, um, teach um, uh, some, of our, uh, some, some of our, um, uh, some of our courses and work with EL students, um, if you can help, uh, if you can, if you can type in some of the things you do to help the level one students in particular, um, uh, level two students and newer students, ways you help them grow, if you can talk about some of the things that you do, I'll, do, I'll continue to do that in the webinar, but I think people would enjoy hearing some of your thoughts. So folks like Anna and Laura, um, I'm going to call you out. Go ahead and type some of those things in the chat there. And thanks, Sarah, for, for, for sharing that. So, so success, and I really want you to think about this. I actually, um, one of the things that I'm excited for that Maui Learning is doing this next year is we actually have partnered with Mindset Works, uh, an organization uh, that was founded by, um, by Carol Dweck. And, uh, and so I had the, to, to create a course for educators on growth mindset 
and I actually had the opportunity to go do a video shoot with Carol Dweck uh, two weeks ago for an hour and to ask her about all this stuff. And what she shared with me was how important it is um, to aggressively help students get in the not yet circle. That the growth mindset will not work if all we're doing is saying, hey students, just as long as you try, it's okay. As long as you put effort in, it's no, we actually want to help the student grow. It's not enough just to try. Like we, we, we want to get the student in the not yet circle and work with them pursuing strategy after strategy until that can do circle is actually expanding. And, and Carol Dweck, if, you, if all of you haven't heard, if there's anyone here who hasn't heard about her, please Google her and learn about her. Phenomenal researcher around mindsets, right? And so, and so what, 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 um, some of the things that you saw in the, uh, um, in the chat box there and things that I believe in are Connecting with the student's culture, for example, is one of the most powerful ways you can help a student in an online environment. So um, early on in our courses, one of the very first assignments that we give them is we ask them to reflect on their families, on their cultures, so that we can have a relationship with them. When you have a relationship with the student, that allows you to better understand what they can do already and what they cannot do yet. And then you can provide that personalized feedback there, right? And so. I'm about to get into question and answer time where you can ask whatever questions you want. And uh, before I do that, I do want to give you my information here. If you have any questions about anything you've heard, you can email me at info. You can email my organization at info at mywaylearning.com. And there's the website. Uh, and this is what we cover today. We start off by talking about why social emotional learning for English learners. You know, what, how important it is, right? And there's research behind it. And it's also a lot of the things stru students struggle with around culture, around fitting in. We got to address those things, right? And um, we talked about leading with super, right? And that strength-based, asset-based philosophy. Um, we talked about inspiring turbo. Uh, uh, actually, we didn't talk about that. But um, we talked about coaching for growth, right? Um, and, and how you do that, right? How you coach for growth. So now, um, I would love to get questions in the um, uh, in, in in the chat box, um, or Susan, if there's anything that you've identified that people have asked about or wanted more information on that you want to type in there for me. Um, uh, and I'll actually um, I'm going to release the mic for a second, Susan, and give you a chance to share anything you want to share or ask anything that you want to ask, and then we'll kind of go from there. Go ahead. Thanks, and I'll release the um, mute on the teleconference too. Often there's background noise, so that's been released. If anybody on the teleconference wants to speak up, oh, please do. Those of you that are with us online on the platform, please, please feel free to type in your questions. There was one question earlier from Wen Mark. Can you talk more about social emotional learning and ELL in the context of online learning specifically? perhaps with feedback online or other strategies. And those of you in the, um, participating in the webinar that want to share your own ideas on successes, please do. A absolutely. So um, talking about social emotional learning from an, uh, in, with ELs in an online environment. So one of the things that, that I found so interesting is that um, a lot of one of the things that really amazed me is that, and something I've heard from my teachers is that students are actually, let's say it's a purely online environment, right? We have found that students are actually um, much more willing to open up with their teachers and share with them because they don't have the fear that someone's going to judge them for their accent or someone's going to judge them um, or, or for this or that. And so that in some ways having that, um, having that online can be a major advantage. Uh, and Really, what, what the, one, one big challenge a lot of folks have is, the biggest challenge really a lot of folks have is, what if we have a student that's a level one student, a level two student, um, really level one, it just came to the States, we're having basic problems um, communicating with them, right? And that's where uh, I would encourage you to use every resource at your disposal. We've had a lot, a lot of success using Google Translator. Um, we've used it uh, for years now um, and had our students use it. And our teachers and students tell us that it's a phenomenal tool for them, right? Um, we're able to connect students with, uh, with students um, from their countries who can help them uh, uh, with the assignments and those kind of things, right? Um, uh, those are some things. We, in some cases, with, so for example, um, one of our districts had a high Creole population, um, had 20,000 Creole-speaking students, right? 
And so for them, we just did video summaries in every, um, uh, in, for every lesson in Creole. We, we just hired a translator. And, and, and so that if a student just came here, um, at least they would see um, the assignments, right? And they would, they would know what the assignments were in their language, and then they could, um, uh, they could use Google Translator to complete them that way. And so really the approach has to be whatever, um, whatever it takes for, for that student, we're going to help them grow as much as we can, and we're going to leverage whatever tech resources we have. Now, um, someone else also had a question around the flip model. Um, and we, we've seen a lot of success with, with the following. So let's say that you're in a blended environment, and it's a combination of some of the time the teacher will have the course up on a smart board in a classroom, and they'll emphasize a specific point. So, for example, if they want to talk about culture or the can you not yet, and they feel like it would be beneficial to go through it together, they'll, they'll have that and they'll, and they'll talk through it, right? Um, uh, other times, they'll say, hey, for this particular lesson, um, I actually want you to go through it on your own. So it'll be more that flip, flip model, uh, and the student will go through it. Then they'll come back and they'll discuss with each other and, the, and complete assignments together particularly assignments that help that student grow in that not yet circle, right? So the blended, um, the, the blended um, uh, environment uh, can lead to some incredible um, uh, opportunities as well. Uh, um, in some, for example, uh, in, 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 some, in some states we work, the English learners have to take a class um, that's online to graduate from high school. Like, like there's laws in some states that students have to take an online class, all students, including ELs. And so um, for those students, uh, we do have to find a way to be a solution to those students, right, uh, and, and, and help them. So for example, the Digital Learning Act in Florida, we've been able to help um, thousands and thousands and thousands of students in Florida graduate that uh, maybe wouldn't have been able to graduate because we offered a course that met their needs. Now, do you shift the language? Absolutely. If you look at our leadership course that we created for, um, uh, for non-EL students, it's a two-semester course that had like 60 lessons in it. It has, it has a lot of, of, of advanced vocabulary, that kind of stuff. Some of the standards we meet there, the way we meet them, is very advanced. Now, with the English learners, um, we still teach those critical uh, um, uh, social-emotional learning skills. Um, we, 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 make the, we make the reading so it's not quite as challenging. We also um, have audio buttons where the student can hear what's, being re what's on the screen. A lot of English language learner teachers will tell you that students can often hear better than they can um, read. And so being able to help students with different model, giving them um, those options is critical. And that also connects to the WIDA standards of, of, of being able to listen, right? So, um, so if you're out there, the person who asked the question earlier, how do you do this in a digital format um, uh, or an online format, what I, what I would say to you is do a full assessment of the the full of, of the vast array of, of tools you have, starting a Google Translator that can help you. If you have certain languages that are high incident languages, create additional create additional um, uh, um, tools just for those students, and then operate with the assumption that even if a student showed up yesterday and doesn't know the language, no one here can communicate with them. Some way or somehow, we're going to help the student grow. That's um so. I, I see a wonderful question from Maria Elena Johnson. What best practice do you recommend for the hesitant English learner? One of my students refused to participate and only speaks to his friends in native tongue. Okay, let's go back to this. Okay, you are the growth coach. Okay, so what I would encourage you to do is create a mad goal with that student around them speaking, um, uh, 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 them speaking and participating. Right. So, so something very small. Something like, hey. I only I just need you to I just need you to um, speak one time each day this week. That's what I want you to work on. So you start with something small in their not yet circle, and then it will expand over time. So, um, so that's what I recommend to you is um, is is show the stu is show the student that hey this is a growth opportunity and you don't have to make them do everything at once. Just have them do something and have them grow. Now one of the things we do teach in our course, by the way, is one of the things we teach in our course that a lot of students appreciate is. We basically tell them, look, to learn a language, you have to make 10,000 mistakes. So you can make those mistakes in 50 years, or you can make them all this year and learn a language quickly. And so our goal at our school is we want you to make all the mistakes right as quickly as you can. 
and we want to make as many mistakes. So raise your hand to make mistakes when you talk. That's fine. I actually, guys, you'll appreciate this. I give speeches in Spanish, 50-minute um, speeches sometimes to English learners. And the reason I do that sometimes is I tell the students, hey, I'm going to make a lot of mistakes in my speech to you, and I'm modeling for you what I want you to do in English, when you speak in English, right? So we have another question. Uh, so I see, yeah, I see now a great... Yeah, um, I'll help you with the facilitation and get some good questions coming in, and I can relate to that. Sorry about my um, grammatical error earlier on talking about the assets each student brings. So we all, we all do it, this idea of not yet um, is really and can do is really important. Um, Suzanne had a question uh, just a little bit earlier. Um, it was an idea. Would you consider publishing a podcast where you interview college students or adults who had defined creative ways to be successful in school as an ELL so they can share techniques and strategies with younger learners just starting the journey? Um, I, I, I love it. I love it. That's a wonderful. That's a wonderful idea, Suzanne. I think it's so important. And I got to tell you, one of um, our students just made me smile so big in in Miami. Um, she was an EL student that came from Cuba a year ago, and she had so many problems. And um, as a service project, what she did was because uh, we have the students do service projects sometimes in the courses. That's by the way, a pet peeve of mine is that I shouldn't say pet peeve. I should say just a uh, enduring belief of mine, one of the ways we discriminate against low-income students, EL students, all these students that we feel like we endlessly have to give to, um, we don't treat them like they can contribute and require of them that they do service projects and build that expectation to them. And yet, when we challenge them to contribute and grow, um, and, and they do it in amazing ways that also help them develop their leadership. And so, this girl, what she did, Suzanne, was she created a club at her school where she gathered all of these, all of the older EL students who'd been there for a year or two, and they did a welcome. Uh, they they created a welcoming club for all the new English learners that would come to the school. And as you know, English learners they can show up in October, November, December, January, all throughout. So now she has a club that um, uh, that meets regularly and welcomes students at her school. That um, that does what you're talking about, Suzanne, is um, showing students, younger students, what they did, right? Now, in terms of considering a podcast where we interview students and adults specifically, that's a wonderful idea. I think that's something we can do at superel.com, and I want to thank you for giving me that idea. That's, that's phenomenal. I think um, that's part of that super ELL um, uh, uh, belief, that super uh, mindset that let's find this, let's, let's show students examples of that college and adult who um, had to find creative ways. And Suzanne, if you have someone that you'd like me to interview, can you please email me and uh, email my team and let us know, and maybe we can get started with that. Great. Thank you. And there's another question from Oregon Virtual Academy ELD coordinator Vanita. How do you get students to show up not only to ELL class, but also general ed classes? Sure. So one of the things that we do um, that really scares the EL students in a good way is, so for example, let's say you're a sophomore in, um, in high school. We show them is that, hey, and we show them, we show them this in the course. Uh, each school, each, each year in the United States, you get 180 days of school if you're in a brick and mortar school, let's say, right? And, um, and so, that means that over the three years, you have 500 days left. Um, and so if you're not showing up to your class half the time, you only have 250 days left. And now you have to pay to go to college next. You're not going uh, to be able to um, keep going to school for free very much longer. So one of the things we do there is we create a sense of urgency and show them that the amount of time they have is finite. The other thing we do, I'll give you an example, is um, there's a teacher we work with in the Chicago Public Schools who told me, we have so many problems with kids showing up late in first period. They, they, all the EL students show up like 30 minutes late, and half my class is there, so I lose a lot of teaching time. It's a similar thing about showing up. So what she did was, with her class, she said, hey, guys, right now we've shown that we can have 50% of you show up on time. That's in our can-do circle. 
in our not yet circle is 75%. I want us to work as a class to get to that goal, and let's do that. So what I would share with you, uh, uh, Vanita, would be use that as a growth opportunity. In fact, um, if I would have had more time today, I would have shared with you something that we have at Maui Learning called the Turbo Button. And the Turbo Button is a metaphor for the action we take. And any time that your students have a problem, oh, I have social anxiety. Um, oh, I'm, uh, these kids aren't showing up in class. Oh, um, you know, they're struggling because they don't want to raise their hand in class. The first, I don't want you to spend any energy in thinking things like, well, you know, um, this, is so, this is so tough. I don't know what to do. Instead, I want you to immediately hit your turbo button and say, okay, what can I do here? Um, uh, can, I, can, I, um, can I have this student mentored by somebody? Can I, have, um, can I set a goal in the not yet circle? What actions can I have that student take? So, uh, so I, would, I would just constantly encourage you um, at your school to, uh, to view each problem that comes up as a growth opportunity for that kid. In fact, um, the, knowing, knowing what the problems are and having them surface is the best possible thing that can happen a lot of times because then you know where to hit your turbo, right? And, and, and then you can apply that turbo there, right? And so that's, that's how I would, I would respond is, um, is you're asking me how do, how do you get students to show up? Um, not only the EL class, but also the gen ed class. I want to ask you, Vanita, and your students the same thing. How will you get the students to show up? Not only the EL class, but also gen ed class. I've shared a few ideas with you, and now it's up to you to really push until you get the answer that works in your environment. That's, that's, that'd be my approach um, to that. So thank Thanks, you for that Mary. question. Yeah, no, that was a great question and, and great thoughtful um, response to Marissa. Put it as really interesting comments in the chat box. And Marissa, I didn't mean to put you on the spot, but I was curious as to where you were from. Um, she talks about remember that some of our students may not have wanted to leave their native country. They may feel isolated and unmotivated. They may not also be here with their parents. It's important to let them know we are here for them and that they are all important to the culture of the school. We need to embrace them and celebrate what they bring. And she goes on a little bit later to talk about. Um, following up on a, a comment that was made earlier on how they have a similar club in their high school where they pair up students that have been reclassified with newcomer students to show them away so that they have a sort of a peer-to-peer -peer network on, on how to help navigate um, and move. And I thought that was a beautiful example. Um, and, and again, didn't mean to put you on the spot. was just really curious as to where that was happening. California, great. Um, Thank you. And let me just take the um, phone line off of mute for a second. We were getting interference. See if there are any questions. Let me just pause. Any questions coming from the phone? Nope. Okay. All right. Oh, so Great. Susan, I, well, just, I just typed into the chat box a link that people can watch of a school we worked with where the administrator basically says the same thing, that a lot of kids didn't come here by their choice, which is true. And, you know, it's possible to address that. I think you can make the students feel like, hey, although you didn't come here by your choice, you know what, we love you. We think you have tremendous opportunity in this country. Um, we're creating an environment where we view you through the super lens, and we think you should too. And we're going to help you grow again and again and hit your turbo button. So I would say um, that's something a lot of educators have shared with us uh, around um, the struggles their students have. And, uh, and that's why the work we do around social emotional learning is so important and so critical, is that we can help those students who are struggling and feeling like, why am I even here? I want to be back home. We can help inspire those students to realize that, wow, no, this country can be amazing for me. Um, and so I want you to, I want to thank you for bringing up that concern. That's a, that's a concern we hear so much. Um, and Susan, I want to thank you for highlighting that. Well, thank you, Maui. We're at the end of our time right now. We've got comments on Turbo Up. And just thank you so much for your generosity, time, spirit, all of the work you're doing. Today's webinar was packed with so much great information. Uh, I just want to let everyone know it will be uh, archived. It's been recorded and you can um, share it with others. We'll be sending it out in three to five days to everybody that registered or you can get it on the INACL website. 
Uh, there are other topics that are important to you you that we can bring people together and share, please let us know at INACL. And a last big round of applause and thank you for Maui uh, today. Thank you so much for joining us. Bye-bye. Thanks, Susan. That was fantastic. I want to thank INACL as well. Um, that was just a great time. And thank all of you for being here.